Well, as I flagged earlier, uh, Graham Samuel is going to join us now, a man who needs a little introduction. He's not shy about making his views known, which is not a bad thing given the challenges that companies and investors face at the moment. Graham is a professorial fellow in Monash University's Business School and School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine. He's also, of course, undertaking the capability review of APRA, and he was co-author of that APRA CBA report that we were just talking about. If I can Welcome Graham Samuel to the stage. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know, I sort of think you should have been on the stage with all of us. It would have been a, a, an all in. It would have given me less time to get into trouble, I suspect. <laughs> yes, possibly. But, yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start with what I guess reactions to what you've just heard. I thought there were a number of very insightful comments. I was particularly impressed by Rebecca's comment about the role of the director, which is to be an intelligent, independent, courageous thinker, someone who's there to challenge. And I think that that's a fundamental message um, that has come out of both the CBA report and out of the uh, Hain Royal Commission. So if you read chapter six of Hain and you have a look at the CBA report, it's the, the ability to challenge, the courage to challenge, to have that intelligent, um, independent thinking. So I was really impressed with what Rebecca had to say. Because from your recent comments, it would seem that you think that most directors are not up to the task of don't have the courage and, and, and don't challenge. Uh, I, I make the deception on this basis, Ali, that we, we look at CBA uh, and we look at um, the Hain Royal Commission. And you have to ask yourself, who was governing the organisations that were the subject of such critical reviews, both in the CBA report and then uh, subsequently in the Hain Royal Commission, who, who was in charge, who was dealing with it? Um, and th that raises some serious questions in my mind as to whether the, the persons who were in charge, the people that were governing, and it's not just the CEO, it does go to the board, whether they um, had the knowledge or had the, um, the cap capability to actually to be able to challenge and to deal with, uh, I'm not talking about individual um, uh, you know, elements of, of misbehaviour, I'm talking about systemic issues that Hain revealed. Uh, and uh, let's not just focus on the you know, half a dozen or so that were the subject of what I call those case studies, the, um, the theatre of uh, the interrogations by Michael Hodge and Rowena Orr. You know, what, what was very interesting was that within one month of Haynes starting the Royal Commission, he had from every one of the organisations that he uh, asked for um, confessions by them uh, as to what they saw as their misconduct over the past 10 years. So they knew about it. You know, they were able to find out reasonably quickly what was involved. I think I read one report, he had 70,000 documents that were submitted. So in many respects, he could have done his report after the first month. Now, if, 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 if the organisations knew about these things and were able to confess <laughs> under subpoena, then you, you know, I wonder why it is that, that you know, this wasn't happening before. Well, I mean, I guess that goes to the number of it. What, what do you think it is? Is it about... Uh, people sitting around a board and not being comfortable to challenge, being too collegiate to challenge, not having the information to challenge, being too stupid to challenge. Uh, I mean, I just wonder yeah. where, you, where you put that and indeed whether the lessons out of APRA CBA and, and Hain can really be uh, expanded to include all of corporate Australia without saying everyone has, you know, it is, is a disaster. Uh, look, look, I have to say to you, I'm, I'm particularly delighted, as is Julian Broadbent and John Laker, my co-authors on the um, uh, CBA report, that it has been welcomed by uh, both the regulators, both APRA and ASIC. Uh, it's been welcomed by corporate Australia. Uh, Grant King described it as, um, that's the president of ECA, described it as setting a new benchmark. I took him to task on that. I said, no, it doesn't. In my view, it sets the same benchmark, but it says if you fail to reach that benchmark, you've got a problem. Um, and the CBA report, 110 pages, uh, the uh, chapter, seven, uh, chapter 6 of Hain, another 140 pages. So there's 250 pages in total. Not an awful lot to read. Um, but I do note that, for example, APRA asked 36 other institutions to self-assess. The pity of that self-assessment was that there's only been one organisation being prepared to make their self-assessment public, which is NAB. And NAB has said, this is our self-assessment according to the CBA, you know, measured against the CBA report, and here ha here's how we assess ourselves to, um, uh, to match up. In 12 months' time, we're going to assess again according to our own self-assessment to be able to 
work out whether or not, we, you know, and to let you, the public, see whether or not we've you know, undertaken the sort of remediation that is fundamental. The importance of transparency is this. If you've got 5,500 or 50,000 employees, there's going to be one that will say, you've gilded the lily. You haven't actually told the truth. And that's important. They, it won't be a whistleblower. It'll just be some employees or some executives, or whatever it is, that just simply says you haven't been honest. And so I think the self-assessment process that APRA adopted um, you know, following the CBA uh, exercise was very important. We've got to remember this with CBA. Um, it was a voluntary exercise. You know, APRA insists on the prudential inquiry. But from that time forward, Catherine Livingston, I've got untold admiration for Catherine. She directed the organisation to be totally open and totally transparent. The directors engaged in interviews with the, uh, the panel, that is with Gillian Broadbent, John Laker and myself. And we conducted a number of those interviews. There were 60 interviews in total. So there was a total process of transparency and openness. And that's how we got to the result. And then Catherine, um, as chair, welcomed the result. And you'll see that what she has done is undertake a renovation of her board, which suggests in one way or another that maybe she says, she, she was saying, I think the board needs improvement. Now, I, I'm going to make an observation because now you're going to ask me in a few minutes about the closed shop and all those sort of things, et cetera. So I might as well put it to rest very quickly now. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that what we ought to be focusing on is diversity with our boards, but importantly, getting better directors, directors who actually can provide diversity of skills, diversity of culture, diversity of, of gender. Um, and whether it's a 30% level uh, that, that I know is, is, is one of those that's been set, and I think Axie the other day uh, talked about the possibility of lifting it to 40%. I don't really care. You know, if you've got 100% female directors and they're all really good directors who are, have got that, as Rebecca put it, intelligent, independent thinking, the capacity and the capability and the courage to challenge, have got a commitment to the role of a director, um, then three cheers, I'll vote for them tomorrow. You know, this is, this is what's important, is better directors, diversity of culture. There's University of Sydney report that um, uh, says that the, the diversity of culture is a really significant issue in the multicultural society that we have in Australia today, yet it is lacking. And they talk about in that report about the, the, one of the inhibitors to diversity of culture and diversity of, of gender is the, the, um, the network. Uh, and, and the fact that, that uh, people don't go outside the network. Now, let me again commend Catherine Livingston for what she's done with CBA. I'll bet you if I asked you around this room, who knows Genevieve Bell, I'd get very few hands coming up. Yeah, one there, I yeah, picked I was going to say, if you don't, you should. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but I saw one over there, not too many. Genevieve is a professor at the ANU. Um, her fundamental training is anthropology. Anthropology, would you believe? No. Her real training and her real skill is in the relationship of human behaviour and culture with artificial intelligence. That has got to be one of the most insightful appointments that could be made to the CBA board, Professor Genevieve Bell, that you could see. Catherine went outside the square and looked for people who could provide the right diversity in terms of the skills that she saw that CBA would now require. And I'll get to that issue of clubs in a minute, but the, the idea of needing better directors, who instigates that process? I mean, it's, it's obviously far easier at an organisation like the Commonwealth Bank because they've been through such a crisis. But for, for most companies, do they just trot along as they are? Do you think most companies need to look at themselves and whether or not they have the capacity to challenge? Well, if they don't, they'll end up with the same sorts of problems that um, we found with CBA. Um, I, see, I was interested the other day, Lindsay Maxted um, made a comment that uh, uh, yeah, was quite interesting, and, and some of it came out in the comments that were made by the panel before this session, um, which is the ability of directors to actually know what is going on. And Lindsay said, and I don't want to verbal him, but um, Lindsay said something to the effect of, look, it's really hard for directors to know all the issues that, for example, were raised in uh, the Hain Royal Commission. Um, I, I don't agree with Lindsay on that for this, for this reason. Um, we all know that there are the three lines of accountability or three lines of defence. And the first line is, is those who are at the coalface who actually ought to own the behaviour, own the issues. The second line is the chief risk officer and the risk management and, uh, and the like. And then the third line is the ultimate safety line, it's the internal auditor. But interestingly as well, if you look at all the charts, and they're there, if you just do a Google, Google search, sitting atop that's the audit committee, the risk committee, 
and the Remuneration Committee, and then sitting atop that's the board. Um, and um, I'm hoping that when Elizabeth Alexander talked about removing the layers, she wasn't talking about removing some of those layers because they're all really important layers as information comes up to the board and the board then knows primarily, of course, through the internal auditor and the audit committee, what it is that's going on and what are the problems. Now, in CBA, we found failings at every one of those layers from the board through to the audit risk and remuneration committee through to the internal audit processes and the like, and then moving through to the chief risk um, uh, elements and, uh, and then ownership at the bottom. And when you've got all those failings, then you have a, a fundamental problem. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what hit uh, CBA. Now, Catherine's recognised that, and, and there's been some fundamental changes that have been made at CBA, uh, and many other organisations are doing the same. Having got the CBA report, they're now measuring themselves against it, and hopefully, What's happening is that they're taking the 35 recommendations of that report and saying, yeah, look, we ought to be improving in this respect or that respect. It's not just financial institutions either. You know, as Grant King has said, this applies to um, all organisations. And James Shipton, chairman of ASIC, has said every corporation ought to read that report and measure themselves against it. What do you think of the comments made in the earlier session regarding blurring of the lines between management and board? And I know that a lot of what's behind that is an increasingly aggressive approach from regulators who demand more information from boards about what they're doing. Yeah, look, if you, I don't think the lines need to be or should be blurred. I think if you adopt those processes, the three lines... Do you lines, think they have been blurred? Uh, well, it, it will depend upon how directors react to CBA and to Hain. Um, you, you know, as I say, Grant King said there's a, it's set a new benchmark and I have disagreed with him, I spoke to you about it, I said no, I don't think it does. Um, uh, CBA uh, really says here are the lines of accountability and they apply frankly in every organisation and beyond those lines of accountability, particularly as you move up beyond the internal audit process, you've got those through the audit committee, risk committee, REM committee and the like and then the board. And providing that all those processes are working properly, that they're functioning properly, then you've got a board that is well informed, provided has got the right directors, they've got the intelligent, independent thinking that Rebecca talked about, um, and the courage to challenge. And if they do just that, then you'll get yourself, you're not, well, I was going to say, gets, keep yourself out of trouble. What's more important is that you'll have a proper, functional rather than dysfunctional um, governance organisation. It's one of the reasons why, whenever I'm talking about these areas, um, I now talk about GCA. Uh, governance has to come first. From governance will flow culture. From all that will flow accountability and remuneration is a subset. We talked about remuneration in the previous panel, um, uh, Ellie, and you, you know, one of the things I, I think with remuneration is this, is you can set all sorts of ticker box rules, but fundamentally remuneration structures should not be designed not to disincentivise, I'm using the double, double negative, not to disincentivise misconduct. And what was happening, and we found it in CBA and Hain found it elsewhere, was that remuneration structures either were not disincentivising misconduct or in some cases were actually incentivising misconduct. So that if you, for example, were selling, I'll call them dud insurance policies, credit card insurance policies where you knew that the person buying the policy couldn't possibly make a claim because they didn't qualify, but you were being remunerated because the more of these policies you sold, the more that you, 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 you earned. Commissions, for example, will, will end up doing very similar things. That's what Hain focused on uh, and it's what we focused on in our remuneration chapter in the CBA report. So how do investors, how do the people in this room drive that sort of, that sort of uh, change and drive a board like that? It's a very interesting question because there's a problem uh, and, and I'm going to highlight it. Um, in CBA, they got a strike against their remuneration um, report. This was, I think, in 2016. The strike was not about paying too much or, or the like. What it was about was this, is that the previous structure of dealing with uh, incentives, you know, bonuses and long-term and uh, short-term incentives, was based on a 75-25 mix. That's 75% related to financial performance and 25% related to non-financial um, issues and non-financial risk. And what um, the, the board of CBA decided to do was to move that and to move it to 50% non-financial and 50% uh, financial performance. And the investors actually gave them a strike uh, and um, said, no, no, that's not acceptable. 
Now, I think investors are going to need to deal with the fact that the community and parliament is now saying it's not good enough. The financial issues are very important and financial rewards are important, but that what parliament and the community is now demanding is that non-financial issues and all the issues that Hayne talked about uh, in uh, his report um, were all essentially about non-financial issues. They were about misconduct, unethical conduct, inappropriate conduct, conduct that didn't meet community expectations. And investors will need to deal with that, I think, and to embrace the sort of process that Catherine and the board try to introduce in CBA, rather than giving them a first strike that said, no, no, we don't want that to happen. We want you to go back to 75, 25, with a bigger focus on, on issues of uh, financial performance. Which brings us, and I'm going to open this to the floor for questions in just one minute, but it does bring us to the question of the regulators. And we talked in the earlier session about uh, APRA having a, a greater role and certainly probably mm. being uh, more prescriptive about uh, remuneration. The role of the regulators in bringing about this change as well, are they up to the job? I won't comment on APRA because we're doing the capability review of APRA at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, as I have briefly commented, I think that under the new leadership of James Shipton and uh, as deputy chairs Karen Chester and Dan Crennan, you'll see a whole new, a whole new sort of concept coming out of, um, uh, of ASIC and, and I think it's one that we've needed for many, many years uh, and it will be there and it'll be very important. Um, don't measure ASIC or APRA by the number of times they go to court. It's the one area of, of Hain and the only chapter or paragraphs I disagree with. Um, the court is a last resort process. It's a really complex, difficult process to, uh, to deal with. The federal court doesn't necessarily have the skills um, uh, amongst those that are sitting on the, the bench to be able to deal with complex corporate and securities transactions. They've had two recent appointments that are an attempt to address that. But if we're going to deal with the vast array of things uh, that were raised in Hain, then you shouldn't view the fact that they've been to court on this number of occasions is the, the single most uh, evidence of success. Um, as far as APRA is concerned, I've said publicly, I think that, that APRA has got an ex ante role. It's got a role to try and ensure that behaviour is right um, and that organisations don't need to come under the, the, the examination or investigation of ASIC because ASIC is there to deal with breaches of the law. Um, now, I think these are going to be the interesting elements, that we're, and of course we'll deal with one element of that when we, uh, we deal with the capability review of APRA, which is due by um, the 30th of June. Um, in terms of ASIC, what I think is going to be very interesting is this. There are specific illegal conduct issues that ASIC is dealing with, but I noticed a comment by Richard Glewis in The Australian the other day where he speculated that uh, APRA, not APRA, that ASIC was looking now at possible test cases on a very, very important provision of the corporation's law, which is that directors have a duty in carrying out their responsibilities to act with care and diligence. And it's going to be very interesting indeed to see if, that, if, if Richard's got that right, um, and if he has, if there is a test case and what the results of that might be, because that, I think, has a more significant consequence than almost anything else. That is, the potential for a court to say, when you are a director of a company, you're supposed to exercise care and diligence under the law, and that means as follows. But you, you've made that point before, that uh, you put one person away and it will send a message to all. I mean, is that the sort of thing that you're thinking of? Well, no, because I think that involves criminal prosecutions, and criminal prosecutions are very complex indeed. Um, they require, obviously, proof beyond reasonable doubt. They involve um, a breach of the criminal law, and you've got will to... Will we get one, do you think? Well, I don't know, uh, ask ASIC, ask John Price and he might tell you, although I doubt that he will. Um, but, but I think what's more important is this, is if you've got a civil case for a breach of director's duties, one of the remedies available is to ban a person from being a director for a, a given number of years, I think up to five years. That'll be very interesting to see a, a senior director who, um, if there is a test case, um, uh, and, it's, uh, and uh, that director's found to have failed in carrying out that duty of care and diligence and then being subject to a banning order. That'll be very interesting indeed. Let's open this to the floor for questions. Um, down here. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, Ed John from Axi. I just wanted to take uh, issue with one of the points you raised, or the two, two conflicting statements around uh, the incentivisation or the lack of downside for 
non-financial issues, be they customer or uh, regulatory issues. I think you've mischaracterised the 2016 CBA vote. Um, certainly for the funds in this room, the vote was not about the existence of non-financial issues. It was actually about the application uh, of the board's discretion. If you rec recall, yeah. that was the year of the common shore issues as well as other regulatory concerns. And when we read the re remuneration report, the lowest bonus for anyone in that key key management group was 95% of target. Mm. So that, that's, that was the concern, not the existence of culture and other measures. Um, so, sorry, Ed, can I ask you, you don't see, think that was a fair comment that investors will have to get their heads around the need for more focus on non-financial risks, because would you argue you're already there? Uh, yeah, I think there, there are a huge amount of supporters of non-financial risk being included in remuneration and part of the strategic discussion on the last panel, but it certainly wasn't the driver behind the CBA vote in 2016, in our experience. Yeah, look, look, I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure that we're that far apart, but um, let, let, me, let me say to you, there is an increasing discussion taking place worldwide. Uh, Larry Fink produced a, a, an excellent paper over in the United States, that's the uh, fund manager there, about the whole issue of um, financial performance, uh, what I call the 60-year-old Milton Friedman mantra that the sole purpose of a company and of directors is to maximise the wealth of shareholders um, versus some of the other issues that are now raising their, their um, head at the moment. ESG is, is, is obviously one. Um, and it's very interesting. We've got issues of activism, which is, is now raising its head um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the role of investors. Um, it's very interesting, activism. See, when we talk about activism relating to uh, workers' rights, uh, the, the role of unions and the like, then there is a, an instant reaction, uh, most often at the political level, that says it's going too far. Um, but when we talk about activism, and I, I noticed that Elizabeth uh, Alexander commented that um, at Medibank they no longer invest in tobacco and they've got uh, carbon limits, if you like, in terms of their, their investment. Now that is, you know, in a sense, um, a, a, you know, partly uh, they're exercising a view on ESG uh, and I think that, that if we recognise that a company is simply a, an artificial legal construct which involves, if you like, a partnership between all the shareholders represented by their agents, the directors, if shareholders through the community broadly say, these are issues we want taken into account, these are important issues, um, and they ought to be taken into account along with the, the um, uh, you know, financial performance of the company, then we'll have to see directors reacting accordingly. Do you have one more quick question? Thank you. Um, Mr Samuel, my name's Mary. I have the great pleasure of working for Hester Superannuation Fund and chairing the Ministerial Advisory Council in this state for gender equality. Hester is, um, and I'll note your opening remarks about the preparedness to challenge, and so in that spirit, Hester is uh, very proud members and active members of the 30% Club, and I feel mm. a little bit dissatisfied with your commentary around the closed shop, and I wonder if you'd like more time to reflect on those comments, given the facts yeah. that are now apparent to you, yeah. which would be that um, uh, in the three, there are 303 female directors in the ASX 200, 70% of whom only hold one board role, 16% mm. of whom hold two. And your comments on Catherine Livingston, I think, are, are profoundly right. Uh, she holds four. Mm. Is she a part of the closed shop? Yeah. Uh, can you expand, perhaps, and offer some solutions? Yeah. Look, look, this closed shop stuff, you know, is, is very, very interesting. And, and when I made the comments I made, and, and they were colourful, um, I got a, an instant, um, almost, well, I'll say vigorous um, uh, critic from several people, most of whom were uh, demonstrated in the um, uh, financial review on the following day. I have to say to you, though, I have to say to you that I received literally tens and tens of emails and texts and phone calls from people saying, thank you, you know, thank you for having the courage to say it because we are some of those who can't enter into the system. I did not, by the way, confine my comments to females. They were, uh, they were re referring to the, the network, if you like, that surrounds both male and female directors. Let me give you a very good example. And it's purely as an anecdote, and I know we're running out. I've got about 18 seconds. Um, I, I was involved um, in an organisation, and the chair asked me, uh, he said, look, I, I need a new director. Can you suggest someone? 
I said, yes, you really need experience in di digital media. I've got exactly the right person for you, and this is her name. And he went away, he came back to me the next day, he said, it's too early for her. I said, mate, she's 55 years of age, she's been in the business for 25 years, how much longer do you want? He said, she's not a name. Now, that story um, I use over and over again because it's been related to me on so many occasions. And so all I'm saying, and, and you know, the, the concept, you, you don't misunderstand me about the 30%. Uh, I, I reckon the 30% ought to be up to 100%, but they ought to be the right directors, and that is directors who satisfy Rebecca's comments about independence, insight, intelligent thinking, and the courage to challenge. And if you've got the right diversity in terms of gender, if you've got the right diversity in terms of skills, and the right diversity in terms of um, uh, culture, then you've got a really, really good board. Uh, and that's what I think Catherine's actually doing with CBA. She's putting together a board um, at CBA that is dealing with the challenges raised by the CBA report. And I'm sure there are many other boards doing the same thing. So don't hang me on you know, some colourful comments I made at the AFR Banking and Wealth Summit. I'm on your side. I'm trying to get more diversity, but I'm trying to get it with um, a vast, a vast array, uh, array of talent that is there, um, out there in corporate land, former CEOs in particular who have got the ability to make the sort of contribution that we um, desperately need to provide better boards and better directors on our boards so we don't have a repeat of CBA and we don't have a repeat of the Hain Royal Commission in five years' time when suddenly we're saying, what has happened? And all our directors in the earlier session were very confident that we wouldn't have a repeat, that there won't be a return to complacency. You're not that confident? Um, I, I have to say to you, um, Ali, that having seen what's happened with, and I'm old enough to have seen this, what happened with Poseidon Booms, and I gave evidence before the Ray Committee in that, um, uh, where uh, we recommended various things and there were changes to the law. Then we had main line, the mainline crash and we had the takeover boom and crash of the, uh, the 80s. And then we had the GFC, and, and you, you say to yourself, when are we going to learn? I think the only way we will learn is if the wake-up call of the Hain Royal Commission is a constant wake-up call by the use of taser guns by the regulators. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Graham Samuel very much for his insights.